the time has come to analyse another very highly requested character. This week we are going to be breaking down and analysing everything that we know about the fan favourite character Rangiku Matsumoto. She is easily the most physically attractive female within Bleach, so it is easy to reduce her role within the story as somebody who is there for fan service. While she certainly does have her fan service moments, I believe that there is much more to Rangiku's character than first meets the eye. So in this video we are going to go over all of her appearances within the story, analysing her past and present, as well as the bonds that she has formed with notable characters like Ichigo's father, Orihime, Hitsugaya, Ginichimaru and the other lieutenants of the Gotei 13. Especially the lieutenant of Gin, Izuru Kira, she was able to relate to him with the pain that they had felt with Gin's betrayal, Rangiku being Gin's lover while Kira was his right hand man. I'll talk more about this when I speak about Rangiku's role within the Soul Society arc. Now before I give everything away about her in the introduction, let's begin my analysis of Rangiku. Before the video begins, only 79% of the people who watch the content on my channel are subscribed. So if you enjoy these videos and want to continue seeing more, then definitely help to support me and my channel by subscribing and turning on the bell notifications. Thank you for your support and now let's dive into the topic of this video. Rangiku makes her debut appearance within the story in chapter 80 and in episode 24 of the anime. Aside from the most notable feature of her appearance, she has wavy flowing blonde hair with blue eyes and an iconic beauty mark under the right side of her mouth. Her appearance is consistent in the sense that she wears a signature pink scarf over her shoulder throughout her many different appearance changes over the course of the story. During the present timeline of Bleach, Rangiku is the lieutenant of the 10th division and serves under her captain Hitsugaya, but about 20 years ago in a past that we see during the Everything But The Rain flashback, we do get to see that she was previously working under Ishin Shiba, who was the former captain of the 10th division. Now as a character, Rangiku is very easygoing and loves to get carried away with her drinking habit. Her laid back nature is heavily contrasted against a captain Hitsugaya, who makes up for her slacking and carefree attitude. Despite their differences, the captain and lieutenant duo are incredibly close and have known each other since Hitsugaya was a child. After all, it was Rangiku who had suggested to Hitsugaya to join the Shinigami Academy. Being one of the lieutenants of the Gotei 13, she also shares a tight-knit bond with the other lieutenants. Through her friendships, we see an empathetic and sensitive side to her character, how she feels guilt with Izuru Kira after Gin is revealed to be a traitor. She also sympathises with Hitsugaya when he feels concerned for Momo during the Soul Society arc. In general, Rangiku is a source of support and comfort for the people around her. Her childish ways are balanced with her words of wisdom that she shares to help others, like how she had comforted Orihime during the Aronka invasion of Karakura Town, when Orihime had been feeling jealous of Rukia and was really unsure if she was any help to Ichigo. It was thanks to Rangiku's support that Orihime was able to come to terms with her feelings. She didn't become bitter or resentful towards Rukia, and she was able to understand that Ichigo is still very young and needs time to figure things out, proving that Rangiku does indeed have a very sympathetic side. Now, in addition to this, she is also a very capable fighter, while she has to be if she is a lieutenant of the Gotei 13. Now, we see her taking part in several battles during the long duration of the Aranka arc, as well as assisting Hitsugaya in his battle against the Stenritter Baz B during the Thousand Year Blood War arc. A very important aspect of her character is the bond that she shares with the Captain Ginichimaru. He was after all her childhood friend, who had turned into her future love interest. Now through Kubo's subtle writing we learn about the past that they had shared, and how their relationship was teased throughout the duration of the story, until Gin's untimely demise during the fake Karakura Town arc. So now that we know some basic background information of Rangiku's character, let's now discuss the defining events of her past, so that we can understand how she had formed this bond with Ginichimaru. Now very little is known about Rangiku's early childhood aside from the fact that she was born within Rukongai. She must have been born in one of the poorer districts of Rukongai, because when she was rescued by Ginichimaru she was wearing really tattered clothing and was found to be starving. He had found her by the side of the road and had told her that if she had collapsed from starvation then that means that she possesses considerable spiritual pressure. An important fact to note is that residents of the Soul Society never become hungry, as they have no need for food. The only exception to this rule are gifted souls who have spiritual pressure. This is what leads to individuals within the Soul Society feeling starvation. Because they possess spiritual pressure, it makes them eligible for entry into the Shinigami Academy. We know that this is similar to the past of Rukia and Renji, who had also stolen food 
Buddhist children because they too had possessed spiritual pressure. And of course, Gin was aware that Rangiku was starving because he too possesses spiritual pressure. And it was through this meeting that the two of them had gotten to know each other and they had formed a lifelong close bond. During their time together, Rangiku didn't know the day that she was born. So Gin had suggested that they mark the day that they had first met as her birthday. In chapter 415, we learn more about Gin and Rangiku's backstory. At this point, the two of them were living together as we see Gin collecting some branches. In the distance, he had seen three Shinigami kneeling and handing to a young version of Sosuke Aizen and glowing orb. Gin had realized that these were the same three Shinigami that he had seen near the collapsed Rangiku when he had first found her. He quickly understands that Aizen is their leader and it is here that Gin had decided to take revenge against Aizen because he had stolen an irreplaceable part of Rangiku, which was a piece of her soul. Aizen, of course, had taken a part of her soul in order to grow his Hokyoku. In chapter 133, we learn from Rangiku that Gin had a habit of disappearing without telling her where he was going. Chapter 416 gives us an example of one such occasion, as Gin had left Rangiku without telling her, leading to her following his footsteps in the snow. She had eventually discovered Gin wearing a Shinigami Shihakusho with blood on his face. He had told her that he has decided to become a Shinigami because he wants to make things better for her. Gin's desire is to never see Rangiku cry again, because after all, she is the only person that Gin had truly cared about. And we only really get to appreciate this by paying attention to the brief flashbacks that we get prior to his death. Gin had sworn vengeance against Aizen. He had wanted to restore Rangiku and give back to her what Aizen had taken from her. We are aware of the lengths that Gin had gone through in order to fulfill this purpose, sacrificing decades of his life in order to avenge Rangiku. Through this backstory, we know that Rangiku was another victim of Aizen, a victim of his Hokyoku experimentation to be precise. More information about Rangiku is revealed within the Can't For Your Own World light novels, where it is explained that a large part of Rangiku's soul was taken from her. But despite this, she was able to live without any problems. The reason for this is explained within these novels, but I'll cover this information in a separate video when I get around to talking about the novels. Both Rangiku and Gin eventually had enrolled into the Shinigami Academy at the same time. Now, ironically, Rangiku shares a close bond with two white-haired prodigies of the Bleach universe. The first, of course, is Gin, and the second is Hitsugaya. In a special prequel chapter that unveils the origins of Hitsugaya's character, we learn about how Rangiku had first met her now captain when he was just a child. She had bumped into him just as Hitsugaya was being shortchanged by a shopkeeper. The young boy had fallen over, but despite being Rangiku's fault, she ends up yelling at Hitsugaya as she hilariously demands that he stands up like a man and to give the shopkeeper a piece of his mind after being wronged by him. Later, Rangiku had followed Hitsugaya home and she was present when he had woken up and had advised him to stop leaking his spiritual pressure everywhere. This is because it was causing his grandmother to become incredibly cold. Hitsugaya, without knowing, was essentially freezing her. Through this, we learn that Rangiku was responsible for identifying the talents of the young white-haired boy, who would prove that he is a prodigy by quickly climbing through the rankings of the Gotei 13 in order to become one of the youngest captains in its history. Rangiku had advised Hitsugaya to attend the Shinigami Academy because he has a lot of power that needs to be controlled. And if he stays within his comfort zone, being afraid of leaving his grandmother, then his lack of control over his spiritual pressure will unintentionally kill her. So after joining the Shinigami Academy, Hitsugaya had quickly graduated and he had joined the 10th division as the third seat under Rangiku as his lieutenant and his captain Ishinshiba. Now, funnily enough, while being the lieutenant of Ishinshiba, she would regularly criticize him for neglecting his paperwork, which Rangiku within the present timeline often does. Now, if you're paying attention, then you'll realize that Rangiku's work ethic is affected by the laziness of a captain. While she was under Ishinshiba, she was regularly scolding him for neglecting his work, as Ishin would all too often relax when things needed to be done. You could say that she only cared about the work because if Ishin didn't do it, then she would probably end up being stuck with it. But through this dynamic, it is pretty funny to see that in a past, the lazy Rangiku was paired up with a lazy captain. Even back then, a lot of the work used to fall upon the third seated officer Hitsugaya. So while Rangiku wasn't completely diligent during the time, she definitely wasn't as lazy as her current appearances within the story. I mean, if Hitsugaya is your captain, then he is going to be on the ball and not going to let any work slip through the cracks. So she must have an easier time with him leading the 10th division, as opposed to Ishin. We learned that Ishin was the captain of Hitsugaya and Rangiku during the Thousand Year Blood War arc. 
But we also know that Rangiku and Hitsugaya were in Karakura Town during the Iranka invasion. We are aware that they had even been inside Ichigo's home. Now it would have been nice if Ishin had interacted with Rangiku and Hitsugaya, but I'm pretty confident that they must have had a catch up behind the scenes. It's either this or Kubo just didn't plan this far ahead within the story. Because when we first see Ishin in his Shinigami clothing, we see his captain's garb wrapped around his shoulder and we can't really tell what symbol is on the back of it. And until the final arc of Bleach, we don't really get to know what division he used to lead. And Kubo probably decided years later that Ishin best fits within the 10th division, thus making it difficult for Ishin, Rangiku and Hitsugaya to interact in such an early portion of the story, which leads me to believe that he didn't have this plot point planned that far ahead within the story. Now this covers all of the talking points about Rangiku's backstory. Let's now speak about her appearances in chronological order throughout the story. We get our first impression of Rangiku's character through the Soul Society arc, as we see her in chapter 80 attending an emergency lieutenant's meeting. And she has subsequent appearances dotted throughout this story arc, as she is seen accompanying Hitsugaya as he investigates what on earth is going on behind the scenes. She is one of the first lieutenants to be alerted when Momo screams after learning about Aizen's death. In chapter 101, she is also present when Momo tries to attack Gin, believing that he is responsible for killing Aizen. Her attack ends up being intercepted by Gin's lieutenant Izuru Kira. Their fight ends up being broken up, and it is Rangiku who restrains Momo, right before both Momo and Kira are arrested. It is here that Rangiku sees how devoted Izuru Kira is to his captain Gin. In chapter 103, Rangiku hands to Momo a letter that was written by Aizen. This letter most likely would have been taken in as evidence for the investigation of Aizen's murder, that is, if Hitsugaya and Rangiku didn't find it first. Rangiku states that she doesn't know what's written within the letter, but it's for Momo's eyes. She reminds Momo that as a lieutenant, she should feel honoured, that her captain's last words were for her. Later, in chapter 133, Rangiku ends up saving Momo's life, as she stops Gin's blade from attacking an unconscious Momo. Her interference de-escalates the situation, as she tells Gin to withdraw his sword, otherwise he'll have to face off against her, thus proving Rangiku's loyalty to Captain Hitsugaya. Despite the history that her and Gin share, we learn about the information that was revealed within the letter that was handed to Momo. Aizen had told her that Hitsugaya was behind the execution of Rukia. Apparently his desire is to steal the Sokyoku and to destroy the entirety of the Soul Society. In chapter 133, Rangiku wonders what on earth Gin is trying to do, and how much of Aizen's letter was fabricated. Now at this point, Hitsugaya and Rangiku begin to assume that this indeed is Gin's plan, that he wants to use the power of the Sokyoku in order to destroy the Soul Society with its power. It is then that the two of them learn that Rukia's execution date has been brought forward, and it will occur 29 hours from now. Because of this, time is of the essence, and the two of them need to know what on earth is going on. If Rukia's execution goes ahead and the Sokyoku is released, then it will be easy for Gin to execute his plan. In order to put a stop to Rukia's execution, Hitsugaya orders Rangiku to follow him, as they head for the underground chambers of the Central 46. In chapter 168, they discover that all of the members of the Central 46 have been murdered, and they have been at least dead for two days. Hitsugaya realizes that there must be more than just Gin involved in this conspiracy. The Lieutenant of Gin, Izuru Kira, then appears. Both Rangiku and Hitsugaya give chase. As Hitsugaya returns to protect Momo, Rangiku ends up confronting Kira. He was apparently ordered to stop Rangiku. His blind devotion to his captain leads him to be very dismissive of Rangiku, as he draws out his Zanpak Do, declaring her to be a dead woman. Kira immediately releases his Shikai, as we see Rangiku take part in a first battle in the story in chapter 169. She defends against several strikes from Kira. Kira Zanpak Do doubles the weight of anything that it strikes, and after having blocked several attacks, Rangiku's sword becomes very difficult to carry. Rangiku gets out of this situation by activating her own Shikai, which results in a Zanpak Do dissolving into ash. She wonders what on earth has Gin done to Kira, and what does Gin want with her? She remembers when Gin used to wander off into the night on his own, and she thinks to herself, where is it that Gin is wanting to go to? In chapter 172, we do learn that Rangiku was able to defeat Kira, as all of the Soul Society learns that Aizen, Gin, and Tozen are traitors. In chapter 177, Rangiku eventually arrives at the Sokyoku, and she appears behind Gin and grabs a hold of him, apprehending him, as she places her Zanpak Do across his neck. In the following chapter, the Gillian's Nagashion Field comes down to save Gin, as Rangiku is left with no choice but to let him go. Before leaving, he has some departing words for her, as he states that he wouldn't have minded being Rangiku's prisoner for a while longer. He bids her farewell and apologises to her. Now, after the dust settles from the Soul Society arc, we see Rangiku reflecting upon Gin's final words in chapter 180, and she refers to him as a stupid man and that she hates him. Kira ends up visiting Rangiku in the 10th Division barracks to apologise to her. They end up making 
making amends and they comment on how they don't need Gin anymore in an attempt to deal with their feelings of betrayal that they both equally share. It appears that Rangiku and Kira no longer have any hard feelings for the confrontation that they had earlier, and this pretty much sums up Rangiku's involvement within the Soul Society arc. Now there is a lot that we can take away from a character during this arc. In particular is their relationship with their captain Hitsugaya. It is a friendship that rivals that of Ichigo and Rukia, and this is thanks to the chemistry that exists between these two characters, and how their personalities perfectly play off of one another. You love seeing Hitsugaya's seriousness, while Rangiku jokes around and tries to get on his nerves. Despite their differences, the two of them are always working together, and this is symbolic of the trust that they have in each other. Through the Soul Society arc, we learn that Hitsugaya and Rangiku make the perfect detective team. They not only care for others and sympathise with their plights, they also look into the details of what is occurring as proven by their suspicions of Rukia's execution and the motives of Gin, as well as the death of Aizen. Without a shadow of a doubt, Rangiku and Hitsugaya have one of the closest captain and lieutenant bonds out of any of the other members of the Gote 13, and like I said, this is because of their mutual trust. Of course, Rangiku's bond with Gin is hinted at during this arc, but we don't really get to know much more until later on in the story. But at this point in the story, we are firmly aware that they have a shared history together. During this arc, Rangiku was a good friend to Momo. She was there to comfort her after the death of Aizen. Now despite the fact that the letter that she handed to Momo did make things worse, Rangiku's heart was in the right place. She had even protected Momo from being killed by Gin. And another important bond that was highlighted was the bond between lieutenants of the Gotei 13. And we saw this through Rangiku's confrontation with Kira. The two of them are close to Gin and expected much more from him. And it is for this reason that they feel a deep sense of pain after learning about his betrayal. Seeing the two of them have an intense confrontation and through their battle we get to learn that Rangiku is very powerful as she ended up defeating him. And I love that at the end of the arc there were no hard feelings. They had made amends with each other and through their shared disgust for Gin's actions, it had strengthened their friendship as fellow lieutenants of the Gotei 13. During the next arc of the story, Rangiku along with Ikaku, Yumichika, Rukia and Renji are tasked to defend Karakuro Town against the threat of Aizen's Orangkars and they are led by Rangiku's captain Hitsugaya. In chapter 199 we learn that Rangiku had stayed with Orihime and it is in this chapter that she ends up confronting her. Now when I spoke about Rangiku having some fan service moments at the start of this video, I was definitely referring to this instance, where she is bathing and Orihime is sharing her problems with her. When Orihime begins to cry and admits that she is jealous of Rukia, Rangiku appears out of the bath without any clothes and hugs Orihime. She reassures her by telling her that she has no reason to be jealous and that Ichigo is a kid that can barely stand on his own. Right now he needs the support of both her and Rukia. She reminds her that Orihime is doing the best that she can to deal with her feelings. She isn't running away from them, she is facing them head on. And this is because Orihime is a good person. And this moment alone reminds me of why Rangiku is one of the kindest characters within the Bleach universe. She really demonstrated her selflessness here by helping Orihime to come to terms with her feelings. During the Arankar invasion of Karakuro Town, Rangiku does take part in a significant battle, where she faces off against one of Grimja's Frashion called Nakim Grindina. In chapter 207, we see her collapsed on the ground, as it appears that she has been defeated. But in chapter 209, when Gente Kaijo has been authorised and the seal that was placed on their spiritual pressure is removed, she immediately gets up and blocks an attack by the oversized Aranka. In chapter 210, we see that Rangiku was easily able to take out Grimja's Rashion. When the Aranka return within Karakuro Town, Rangiku attempts to face off against Wonderwise, but because of the way that the Aranka is acting, she decides against fighting him. Instead, with the other Shinigami, Rangiku attacks Lupi 4 against 1. Now, obviously, it was going to be Rangiku who was caught up in Lupi's tentacles, and she ends up being saved in chapter 233 by the surprise arrival of Urahara. Their battle ends up being interrupted when Ukiyora reveals that he has completed his objective. After Orihime leaves for Huekomundo, Rangiku and the others return to the Soul Society in order to prepare for the coming war against Aizen. During the fake Karakuro Town arc, Rangiku faces off against Haribel's Frashion, Apache, Milaros, and Sonson. During this battle, we get to learn more about Rangiku's abilities through her Zanpakdo Hainako. We had seen during the Soul Society arc that she can dissolve her Zanpakuto into ash, and in a way this is very similar to the abilities of Byakuya Zanpakuto, as in chapter 330 we see the ash from Rangiku Zanpakuto surround the arm of Apache. Rangiku explains that whatever the ash encloses, it ends up transforming it into a tornado. The ash will end up cutting anybody who touches it. Of course Rangiku is overwhelmed as she has to face off against the three of them by herself. She is later assisted by the arrival of Momo. Momo reassures Rangiku as she tells her that she may be worried 
wearing the lieutenant's badge for the 5th division, but it doesn't mean that she is a subordinate of Captain Aizen, because he is an enemy of the Soul Society now. But Rangiku pays particular attention to the way that Momo had referred to Aizen as a captain still. By working together, Momo and Rangiku are able to force the Orangkars to activate their resurrection to heal themselves, and they end up sacrificing their left arms in order to form a creature called Ion. Rangiku becomes frozen in fear when she lays eyes upon the creature. Rangiku is defeated when Ion severely wounds her and takes out the right side of her abdomen, severely injuring her. It is Kira who promptly arrives and ends up healing Rangiku. Despite being healed, she still appears to be wounded and thus doesn't really take part in much more of the battles within Fate Karakura Town. In Chapter 400, we do see Rangiku gain consciousness as she is able to see Ichigo facing off against Gin. The sight of Gin forces Rangiku to get up and chase after him. As in Chapter 405, Kira yells out to her that her wounds were only healed to the point that she could sustain her life. She is still severely injured. In Chapter 411, Rangiku arrives before Don Kanunji and Tatsuki as she protects them from Aizen and Gin. Now these chapters where Rangiku confronts Gin for the first time since the Soul Society arc take place within Volume 47 of the manga. Now at the start of this volume is a poem that relates to Gin's feelings towards Rangiku, as Gin describes himself as becoming a snake, and with that mouth that he uses to devour people, could he also use it to tell Rangiku that he loves her, in the same way that he used to before he had become a snake. The thing is, Gin had done wrong for the sake of Rangiku, for the sake of protecting her. How would he feel if Rangiku had done the same for him? Can he really expect Rangiku to still declare her love for him after all of the wrong that he has done? And is it fair for him to justify all of this wrong by proclaiming that he had done it for her sake? So let's now talk about the reunion that occurs between Gin and Rangiku and what we can learn about Rangiku's character from it. The last time that Gin had spoken to Rangiku was in chapter 178. They are finally reunited in chapter 412. Gin reassures Aizen that he will get rid of Rangiku as he grabs her and takes her away to the rooftop of a nearby building. Gin questions why she is here. He is aware that Rangiku is injured and her body is shaking. She responds by saying that she is here because he is, and she wants to know why is it that he is working under Aizen? Why is it that he had betrayed Kira, his lieutenant, especially after Kira had believed in him so much? But Gin questions her line of inquiry as he asks if she is masking her own feelings of betrayal by speaking about how Kira is feeling. He questions why is it that she had to show up. After placing his hand on the necklace that she is wearing, he tells her that she is a nuisance as it appears that he has taken her out. In chapter 416, Rangiku gains consciousness as she realizes that Gin had knocked her out with a Kido spell called Hakufuku. She rushes to the battlefield immediately after Aizen defeats Gin. It is at this moment that Gin thinks back to the moment that he had told Rangiku that he was going to become a Shinigami in the hopes that Rangiku would no longer have to cry anymore. It is a very tragic end to the character of Gin as he realizes that he wasn't successful in returning back to Rangiku what Aizen had taken from her. But in his dying moments, he feels glad that he was able to tell her that he was sorry at least. And the most tragic aspect to all of this is that Rangiku cries after Gin dies, as Gin was unable to prevent her from crying. Despite having worked so hard and having sacrificed years of his life, his efforts had amounted to nothing. Gin and Rangiku are among a few pairs of romantically involved characters within Bleach, and the way that Kubo had depicted their love story within the manga was tragic yet beautiful at the same time. It wasn't in our face and it was subtle. I just really appreciate the way that it was done and I feel like it made the death of Gin so much more impactful. And the tears that were rolling down the face of Rangiku, who was already severely wounded, it is as though the emotional pain that she was feeling had completely masked the physical pain that she was enduring at that moment. Later in chapter 423, we see Hitsugaya training within a cave and Rangiku standing nearby in the shadows. She thinks to herself that everybody is moving on from the battle against Aizen. She realizes that all of them are sharpening their skills and getting stronger and that she should be too. She is obviously mourning and thinks about the fact that Gin is now gone. But despite this, he didn't leave anything behind for Rangiku to remember him by. She says to herself that she didn't like that about him, but she understands that if Gin had left something behind for her, then it would be very difficult for her to move on, and Gin had probably known this about Rangiku. So in her final remarks about Gin, she thanks him, and she corrects her remark from earlier as she states that she always had liked this about him, referring to the fact that Gin had known her so well. Now we next see Rangiku during the Thousand Year Blood War arc. When the Quincy invade the Soul Society during their first invasion, Rangiku pairs up with Captain Hitsugaya as they face off against one of the Wandan Reich. Hitsugaya had assumed that the Quincy conceal a Bankai, but in actual 
crucial fact, they steal it. So when Hitsugaya's Bankai is stolen, Rangiku ends up warning the other members of the Soul Society. Now when the Quincy return for their second invasion, Rangiku works with Hitsugaya to face off against Basbi between chapters 547 to 550. In the time between the Quincy's first and second invasion, it appears that Hitsugaya had quickly come to terms with losing his Bankai and he had started to train immediately and it appears that he had devised some strategies with Rangiku. And we see the two of them working together facing off against Basbi. Rangiku ends up being transformed into a zombie by the Sternritter Giselle and she is used by the Sternritter to fight against Mayuri. After Mayuri defeats Giselle, he places Rangiku and Hitsugaya into special capsules as he reverses their zombification process. But there is a price that they have to pay. The two of them had to exchange a considerable amount of their lifespan to return to normal. In chapter 644, we see that Rangiku has been perfectly healed and she doesn't really do anything else within the Thousand Year Blood War arc unfortunately. And the next time that we see her is 10 years later during the epilogue where we see her and her captain make their way to Rukia's captain ceremony. While on their way, Hitsugaya teases Rangiku for her work ethic and how Rukia had worked hard and become a captain and Rangiku still hasn't. Through their teasing remarks, it appears that Rangiku still hasn't mastered her Bankai as it appears that Hisagi who is also with them has. I did state at the start of the video there is more about Rangiku's character that is mentioned during the Can't Fear Your Own World light novels. Now this is probably content that Kubo had wished to include within the manga but he didn't have an opportunity to, especially since the end portion of the arc was rushed. Kubo did state before the Thousand Year Bado arc had begun that Rangiku would have a character fleshed out further within the story arc but we didn't really get any of that within the manga. Maybe some of the content that he had planned around a character will be included in the new anime adaptation of the arc that is releasing in October of this year. Aside from wanting to see more of her, I do accept that she is a side character within the larger story and I do accept that she does have a fair presence within it. I think that she is a very well written character and there is definitely a lot more appeal to her than just her fan service. And I love how her character was interwined with Gin's storyline. Rangiku is a kind and compassionate character who we learn quite a bit about during the story. And yes, while there are things that need to still be explained about her, like how she is still surviving with a large part of her soul being taken from her. Like I said, hopefully this will be expanded upon, but this is just a minor nitpick in my opinion. Now I want to hand over the discussion to all of you. What did you think about Rangiku Matsumoto? Do you think that she's a well-written character or do you only like her because of her very unique character design? I would love to hear all of your thoughts about the way that Rangiku is written, so definitely leave your comments and continue the discussion. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and I can't wait to see you in my next Bleach character analysis video. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, then please consider supporting my channel on Patreon. I have multiple tiers with rewards including access to an exclusive Discord server, video scripts, as well as being the first to know about unreleased upcoming videos. Thank you for your time and whatever you choose to contribute, I will appreciate and it will mean a lot to me.